Please turn in your Bibles at this time to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 1. This is on page 553 if you're using the Pew Bibles this morning. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 1. And Solomon writes here as the Holy Spirit leads and directs him. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? I'll stop there. Let's bow forward to prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. It, it approaches us. It uh, comes at us in so many different ways and formats and through all these different authors over so many hundreds of years. And we thank you that uh, despite your servants, Solomon's, uh, I, I guess we'd say very rough patch of life, that even that you used, and some of the things we'll be reading here this morning come from that time, and you use it to drive us to yourself, to the place of true meaning, true purpose, true fulfillment in life. Lord, uh, you know all the people, all the hearts that are here this morning. If there be anyone who at this point does not yet believe in your son, Jesus Christ, use this time, use this message, use your gospel to draw them to yourself and into a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. At a recent dental appointment, someone from our church began visiting with his dental hygienist, and in the course of conversation, he asked her a few spiritual questions. Pause right there for a moment. That's really encouraging. That's what I love to hear, that people just in regular conversation are like, hey, uh, I have a few questions for you, and in a very non-accusatory manner, just a very uh, gracious way, uh, gracious questions, things are asked, and, and good things happen. Praise the Lord for that. Well, this, this young lady related how in, in, in some of these questions and conversations, she related how she was going to City Light Church on O Street and how they have four different church services with a lot of college-age young people going to uh, that, ch that church. And pause again for a second. That also very encouraging, very exciting to me. A lot of times we hear all the bad stuff and think, yeah, kids these days, well, there, there's all kinds of... Uh, young people who are coming to faith in Christ and boldly living for Him, and it, it's awesome. That's a work of God. Now, I'm paraphrasing most of this conversation, uh, but he then asked her, well, what do you think makes your church so attractive to young people? And she said that she and many people from her generation and younger grew up hearing things basically being taught, indoctrinated in one sense, everything is relative. There's no ultimate meaning, no purpose to life. But then she said something like, again, I'm paraphrasing here, what makes this church so attractive is that we hear there is purpose and meaning in life. There are certain things that are right and wrong, and you can know this from the Bible. You can even have a relationship with the one who created you through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, from the human perspective, can you see how th that, that would prob probably be attractive, especially if you've grown up hearing the exact opposite and then seeing how empty your life has been, living out that whole opposite kind of viewpoint, I, I think you could see how that message would be very attractive. Today, we're going to see this very attractive message, and we're going to see this contrast brought out in one of the most unique books of the Bible, Ecclesiastes. I don't know if you've all read through Ecclesiastes or not, but if you have, I think you'd say minimally it is unique. Uh, we're going to see this contrast this morning between life lived as if there's no God and life lived with seeking to please God. Uh, he's in the picture and you're seeking to live for him and how this brings meaning and purpose and yes, even joy to our lives. So I said Ecclesiastes is a unique book. If you haven't read it, maybe you're wondering, well, why do you say that? 
Well, uh, one example, one anecdote. Before I was saved and I was in college, uh, there was a guy who lived right next to me on our dorm floor in college, and uh, Dean Hatfield. I don't know. Do any of you know Dean Hatfield? Oh, yeah. Lots of you know Dean Hatfield. He's, he's in glory right now. Uh, but Dean, Dean Hatfield, when I was in college, he came onto our dorm floor and just would go up and down. And if there is an open door to a dorm room, he took that as, this is an open door. So, <laughs> so then he would go in and start talking to people. So one of the people he started talking with was this uh, guy on, in the room right next to mine. And I don't know, I don't think Dean would have suggested this. Again, I wasn't saved at this time. This guy definitely, I don't think, was saved at this time. But uh, he began reading Ecclesiastes. And so you have these two unsaved guys, he and myself, talking about this a little bit. And other things because of Dean Hatfield's conversations. And uh, he says, you know what? That is a really depressing book. I'm really down in reading this book of Ecclesiastes. Most Bible books don't have that effect. But this one... Ecclesiastes, I take it in some sense, it has as a goal to make people depressed. Now, why would, why would any book in the Bible be like that? It has as a goal, I take it, to make people depressed if people are living as if there is no God. It brings out how, if this is your life, and if everything that you see is just what you can uh, everything that you're living for is just what you can see and taste and touch. Uh, if this is it, Ecclesiastes will bring out, you know, it's really kind of futile. Uh, life is really kind of hopeless and meaningless, and there's nothing to it if, if that's all there is. But then, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon, I would say subtly, points to the alternative to that. That there is meaning in life, and there can even be joy in life as we seek to live a life pleasing to the Lord. Just for some background on this book of Ecclesiastes. It was written by Solomon. And by what the Bible says about Solomon, I, I think we can say that apart from Jesus Christ, Solomon was the wisest person to walk the face of this earth. But as you go on and read more about Solomon in the Old Testament, you see that he did initially some very basic things. They weren't necessarily evil, but some things that began him to go down a path that led to more and more and more evil and wickedness until finally he's worshiping all these false gods, all these idols, and sacrificing them and doing some really evil things in his life. I take it that Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon as the Holy Spirit led and directed him after he had lived through this period of time and had come back to know and worship the true God of the Bible at the end of his life. <clears throat> In many ways, uh, Ecclesiastes is autobiographical of his time when he was living as if there was no God and what life was like for him and, and what it was like as, as he began to think about this. Uh, I, I take it again, a great purpose of this book of Ecclesiastes was to use it evangelistically to make people depressed. That doesn't make sense. But it's as if Solomon is saying, you think that these things the world is holding out as satisfying and meaningful are going to cut it and make you happy and give you a joyful life? Let me tell you, I lived that. And I hated it. And he points to the true God of the Bible as the solution to this depressing alternative. Here's how Bible scholar Walter Kaiser puts it. He says, Solomon may have intentionally written Ecclesiastes with an eye to a wider circle of readers than just the Hebrews. Perhaps those from the Aramean and the other Semitic nations that were then subject to his government and those nations that had caused a good deal of his spiritual downfall through his attempt to placate his numerous wives, we'll hear more about that in a little bit, who hailed from their states. Such a cosmopolitan tendency would be most appropriate for wisdom literature, which had the aim of raising a voice to the sons of men at large, so that all might hear. The book would then have a missionary flavor, as it attempted to use a sort of what we now call cultural apologetics 
to call Gentiles, along with those in Israel, at large, to straighten out their thinking, acting, values, and preparation for their eternal destiny. Had not the queen of Sheba in her faraway setting among the Gentiles heard of the famed wisdom of Solomon and his ability to answer difficult questions? It may be surmised that requests such as hers provided the reason for making a discussion such as Ecclesiastes available to a wider audience of Gentiles. And then he closes with this. A missionary message to the Gentiles would have to begin with those issues that affect all men because all share the image of God and yet are involved in a world that is often unintelligible and hostile. He would begin with the very basic questions of life. What is good? What is worthwhile? What is life meant to accomplish? How can anyone satisfy that gnawing thirst to find out the end from the beginning and bridge that eternity in the heart of all men? So, so keep that in mind as we're uh, reading here this morning, looking at Ecclesiastes. Keep in mind Solomon's background. He's writing Ecclesiastes from the perspective of one who was living his life, and maybe for several years he was doing this, as if the true God that he did know, and he, he literally had heard from this true God, he lived his life as if this true God didn't exist, didn't matter. He looks back on that time, and here's the things that he thought and he did during that time, and he's using that to, to show the meaningless, the hopelessness of life apart from a relationship with the true God. Look how he starts the book again. Uh, look at verse 1 of Ecclesiastes 1. Again, page 553 in the Pew Bibles. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Let's start with that. That phrase, under the sun, uh, the Hebrew phrase translated here is under the sun. It's used 29 times in Ecclesiastes in 27 verses. And the great majority of times that this phrase, under the sun, is used, it's bringing out the mindset that this is all that there is. This world that you can see and hear and taste, touch, whatever, that's all there is. This is all you live for, just the here and the now that you can see under the sun. This is where you find your purpose. This is where you find your meaning, under the sun. In other words, uh, you just this, this is what I'm living for, just what I can get in this world, and leaving God out of the picture. And then he says, if this is it, and he's talking about this life under the sun, if this is it, then what I want to show you in this book is vanity of vanities. All is vanity. And first, this phrase, vanity of vanities, that's grammatically, that's a way of saying, I'm going to show you ultimate vanity. Uh, the extreme of vanity, that's what this book is about. And the word vanity itself, this occurs 38 times in Ecclesiastes. And really, I'd say it's the theme of the book. In English, when we speak of vanity, uh, for instance, the Oxford Dictionary notes that its first meaning is excessive pride or admiration of one's own appearance or achievements. That's definitely not what vanity here is looking at. The second meaning in English that the Oxford Dictionary gives for vanity is this, the quality of being worthless or futile. That's what this Hebrew term is talking about. Donald R. Glenn, in the Bible Knowledge Commentary, he brings out the meaning of this Hebrew term used here, translated as vanity. He says, metaphorically, this Hebrew word means what is unsubstantial or without real value. Uh, that's why I think that Oxford Dictionary uh, definition, the second one, worthless, that kind of gets at the idea. Another Hebrew resource notes or biblical resource notes of this term the connotation unsubstantial, profitless, or fruitless, worthless, pointless, futile. 
throughout Ecclesiastes where this term vanity is used. It's, it's used with another descriptive phrase. Look down to verse 14 here in chapter 1, Ecclesiastes 1 verse 14. He says, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. Striving after wind. It's another term that's used often in this book of Ecclesiastes seven other times. And only once is it not used together with this term vanity. I, I take it it almost is descriptive of what he means by vanity. It, it, vanity, when I'm saying vanity, I, I'm talking about it's a, it's a striving after wind. You, you can just picture someone asking someone else this question. Well, what are you striving for? The wind. <laughs> well, what do you have when you get it? Nothing. Glenn uh, writes of this phrase, and again, it fits with this idea of vanity, meaning that which is without value or worthless. Uh, striving after the wind. It's a graphic picture of effort expended with no results gained, since no one can catch the wind by running after it. That's this idea of vanity. It's like a, a striving after wind. If you wonder why Ecclesiastes can be very depressing, you can see why right off the bat. Solomon starts off saying, Everything is worthless, meaningless, and I'm going to show you even ultimate futility here, and I'm going to tell you why I say this. So, be ready for an encouraging message this morning. <laughs> but remember, there, there's a key if with all that Solomon is saying when he says things like this, and he says it a lot in this book. Everything is worthless, everything is meaningless, there is ultimate futility, unless, or if, there's nothing beyond what's underneath the sun. If this world is all that there is, meaningless, futile, worthless. But there's something else, and we'll get to that this morning. And this is why I think... Uh, action Ecclesiastes, and we're going to see this morning that there's joy brought out in the book of Ecclesiastes too. It's not all negative, it's not all depressing. But if this is it, then yeah, be depressed. If this is all there is. How does Solomon prove this point? This is the theme. He starts off with the book. This is what he, he's aiming everything at. How does he prove this point? He proves it from his own life experience. How so? In this world, in Solomon's day, and I'm, I'm sure throughout all history and up to our very own day, there are certain things held out that, that say, maybe not directly like this, but the idea is there. If you do these things, if you have these things, then you'll be happy. Power, fame, riches, sex, pleasure. This is the subtle message we hear to this very day all around us. And, and, and maybe some of those things or one of those things, maybe you think, boy, if I just had any of this, I'd be happy. Well, the great thing with Ecclesiastes is we have the unique experience of one man. Uh, that very few people in all of history could, could say what Solomon can say here. But we have the unique experience of one man who did attain all these things that the world holds out and says, if you just had this, then you'd be happy. If you just had this, then you'd be fulfilled. And Solomon had, you know, whatever the world holds out and says, boy, you really have it made if you have this. Solomon had it all. And his conclusion is vanity of vanities. All is vanity. And, and we'll see after, this is the theme of the book that he's trying to drive home and, and, and it's going to get worse as he thinks about how everything is vanity as he leaves God out of the picture. Remember, that's always remember that. He, he's coming from the perspective as if God didn't exist. Or, I'm living as if God didn't exist. So look how Psalm brings this out in chapter 2. First, Something the world holds out as a source of joy and Solomon's experience is just pleasure. You know, uh, live for pleasure, just pursue that. You'll have happiness in your life if you just follow that. Uh, well, Solomon had that. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 1. Look, look down there in your Bibles, Ecclesiastes 2, verse 1. 
I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. Then skip down to verse 10. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 10. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart, heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. The world would hold out. If you could have anything you desired, anything, certainly then you'd be happy. You just, and we'll see wealth come up here in a, in a little bit, you just don't have enough money to have everything that your heart desires. So, but if you could really have it, then you'd be happy, then you'd be satisfied. Well, Solomon literally had the wealth and the power to have anything that he wanted, anything he desired. And that's what he tells us here. I kept my heart from no pleasure. Well, we'll see how he characterized his life in a little bit. We've already seen how he said vanity of vanities. It's all, it's all empty. It's all worthless if this is all there is. But as he thinks about that further, we'll see how far he goes. Uh, second, accomplishments and great exploits. So it's, he's not just talking about pleasure seeking. Uh, look down to verse 4. You know, the world would hold out, if you can do great things, certainly in accomplishing great things, you'll find fulfillment and happiness. Verse 4. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. In other words, he, he did productive things. He produced aesthetically pleasing and beautiful things. He accomplished things. He built palaces and parks and pools. Imagine the great estates that you can see in Europe today. The world holds out, boy, if you could have that, if you could live there, if you could be part of such an environment as that, or even just build it, certainly that would bring fulfillment. Someone says, I had it. Vanity of vanities. Third, wealth. The world holds out that money will solve any problems. Wealth, you know, you can build whatever you want. You can have whatever you want if you have enough wealth. Well, Solomon had it more than anyone ever before him in Jerusalem ever had. Verse 7. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. Uh, we don't have time this morning, but if you go back to the uh, book, book of Kings and look at the descriptions of Israel's wealth and Solomon's wealth in the book of Kings, it's almost unimaginable when he talks. It's, he's kind of being low-key here when he talks about this. If you see him described in Kings, he had it all. He didn't just dream what these things might be like. He had it. And Solomon is writing as the Holy Spirit leads and directs him. Uh, so it's Bible. Uh, in the New Testament, Paul, for instance, writes what the, how the Holy Spirit led and directed him. It, it's Bible. It's God's Word. But, but maybe, just maybe, you're kind of thinking, well, if Paul tells me, yeah, I'm content with nothing, well, he didn't really have a whole lot. You know, he, he maybe didn't know how it could be if he was really wealthy. So I kind of wonder if I should take what Paul's saying or not. You should, because it's in the Bible, it's God's word. Take it. But if you are thinking about that at all, here's someone who you can't say that. Here's someone, he did have it all. He did have all the money you could think about, all the treasure, all the gold, all the silver, the possessions, whatever. He had it all. And if you think, well, maybe if someone had it all, they would say, yeah, it really is good. Paul had it. Excuse me, Solomon had it. Incredible wealth. 
And he's already said, if this is all there is, it's meaningless, it's worthless. Fourth, sex. The world today especially holds out the idea, if you could just have sexual freedom, if you could just have enough different women, uh, anyone you want, any time you want, with no negative consequences, then you'd certainly be happy. Look down to the middle of verse 8 of Ecclesiastes 2. Middle of verse 8. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. Now, when Solomon here says many concubines, what's, what's he talking about? Four or five? Uh, no, a few more. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 11, it's, it describes Solomon. It says, he had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. That's, that's where this downward slide of Solomon had. But, but he's describing the world holds this out. If you can have this, certainly you're going to be happy. One of the towns I grew up in, Menno, South Dakota, didn't even have this many people in the whole town. And he had a thousand women who in one sense or another he was married to. So certainly he was a very happy man with all these women just to himself. <laughs> no, no. This isn't one of those days I'm asking for amens. No commentary from the crowd. Well, we've already seen Solomon say, all is vanity. So, I mean, that's the theme. That's what he's laying out. If you think this is going to do it for you, nope, this is vanity. This is vanity of vanities. This is ultimate vanity. I had all this stuff that supposedly would give me happiness. Uh, fifth and finally, power and greatness. Today, uh, to put it in our terminology, certainly they didn't have this in Solomon's day, but uh, today I, I think there's, especially among young people, but maybe not only young people, if you could just be like this famous star or this famous singer with their huge following on Instagram, or if you could just be the one with all the power and be able to tell everyone what to do, then you'd have a sense of fulfillment. Well, look down to verse 9. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. So Solomon was the king. He had power. He was well known even across the world for his wisdom and wealth. He became great in the world of his day. So all these things that the world holds out, this is what you live for, this is what you strive for, this is what will make you, your life happy and fulfilling. In Solomon, we have this very unusual situation of someone who really, he did have all this, and he can tell us, well, how was it? You, you know, these things are held out as this will make you happy. How was it all? Well, we've already seen what he responds to with that. He's setting out to prove it's all vanity of vanities. It's all meaningless. It's futile. It's worthless. It's nothing. If this, if, 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 this is all there is. So how did he react as he realized this, this is just vanity? Skip down to verse 17. Chapter 2, verse 17. So I hated life. He had all these things that we just described. And he says, as he thought about it, and thought about if this is it, so I hated life. Because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after wind. He had all the pleasure he wanted. He had a sense of accomplishments. He had incredible wealth, sex, power, prestige. With all that, he says, I hated life. Today, I don't know how many people uh, think of the implications of vanity or if this is all that there is. I don't know if people think of the implications like Solomon did. <clears throat> this is one sense where probably, as he just said, that still 
Still there is a sense where I had wisdom. I was still thinking about these things. But as he reflected upon this, if this is really all there is, I hate it. I hate it. Verse 18. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. You know, if this is just it, when I die, that, that's it, and then it just goes to someone else. Verse 19, who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will be a master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. And then this is probably the low point of the whole book. Verse 20, so I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. He, he rightfully thought out, and this is just his experience that he's writing about here, if, if this is it, if this world and the things in it, if this is all there is, wow, it's vanity of vanities, but what, what I hate it, I give my heart up to despair because it's meaningless and there's no purpose. One of my professors at seminary, Keith Essex, said, as we were going through Proverbs, I believe, he said something like this, many people learn from their mistakes. True wisdom is learning from other people's mistakes. <laughs> Think about what you've heard and maybe even believe life is about. And this is church, so you're probably not going to say, well, I think it's all about sex. You're probably not going to come out and say something like that. Or I, I think it's all about wealth or you know, any of these things. But maybe in your head you think that. If I just had this, then I'd have joy. Solomon, again, he had it all. And he hated it. So learn from him the lies that our world tells you. Be wise by learning from what he's writing in this book. He pursued all these things, leaving God out of the picture, and he found them empty. It resulted in despair in his life. So I said this wouldn't all be a depressing message. It's not all depressing. That's pretty depressing. Is this the end of the story? No. Is there any hope? Is there any antidote to this kind of pessimism that he's talking about here? Yes, if you live in light of the one who created you, if you live for the one who created you. Remember, Solomon knew the true God. Uh, he, he, in contrast to billions of people throughout history, he, he actually had visionary experience with the true God, a great blessing from the true God. So he knew it, but there was a long time in his life where he was living as if he didn't know it, or as if it wasn't true. So skip down to verse 24 in chapter 2. And this is the first time the name of God is mentioned in this chapter. And coincidentally, no, it's not coincidentally. This is why. I was going to say coincidentally, joy, joy comes into the picture. It's no coincidence. Uh, verse 24. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. You might think, oh, he's still not sounding good here. But, but listen, the, the full statement. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? Now we're no longer looking at life as under the sun. We're looking at life from the perspective that there is the true God, and that this true God does have purposes and plans, and he's sovereign, and that he's the one who created us, and therefore he should be lived for. And, and he gives gifts. Verse 25 brings out that God is the one who gives these things as elements of enjoyment in this world. I, I take it Psalm is not being sarcastic here. We live in this world. And he's saying there's nothing better for a person who lives in this world than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. The, these simple things, these basic elements of life in this world, it's important to take them as from the hand of God. Bring God into the picture. Thank him for them. Enjoy these simple pleasures. And they truly can be enjoyed. 
and not just be looked upon as meaningless when we bring God into the picture. Look at verse 25 again. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? Uh, We see that if we're to receive any good, any satisfaction in our toil under the sun in this life, it's got to come from the one who created us. We, We can't leave God out of the equation and think we'll find meaning or true joy or enduring satisfaction in life because it's only through him that we do have meaning and purpose and true joy in our life. It's only through him that we can enjoy these things. Look down to verse 26. Key verse of Ecclesiastes brings hope in the midst of a very pessimistic chapter. For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. But but note the start of this verse, that that key Bible word for, F-O-R. We just saw that apart from God, there's no enjoyment of these simple pleasures in, in life Now Solomon explains how we can experience this gift of God. Again, verse 26. For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. These are all gifts from God. And if you're living life as if he doesn't exist, as if he has no say-so in how you're conducting yourself or how you should be living, then you're not going to be receiving these gifts from God. Solomon had all kinds of things. He pursued pleasures, whatever his heart desired. He'd go after it, power, prestige, all these things. But as his heart turned from the Lord for a time, he had no enjoyment in any of these things. He had no true joy from any of these things because the enjoyment of these things comes from the hand of God. It comes as a gift. It's it's still up to him. It's on his timing, it's on his determination when he'll give some of these gifts of wisdom and knowledge and joy. But Solomon states plainly here that these gifts come for the one who pleases him. Is that you this morning? Maybe you're thinking, well, who who could ever please the holy, righteous, just creator of the universe? We've all sinned, how could we ever please him? Well, the New Testament brings out uh, how we can, and it all revolves around Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ eternally existed as God the Son. And then at a point in time, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus took on flesh. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He never ceased being fully God, but, but now he took on flesh. Now he became a man, even from the womb. He was conceived And born, he's fully God, fully man. God the Father said of Jesus Christ at Jesus' baptism, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, maybe, there we go. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So there's someone who pleased the Father, Jesus Christ, he never sinned. He was always perfect. He always did what was pleasing to the Father. Yet at the end of his life, he was put to death on the cross. And it was for nothing wrong that he ever did in his life, but remarkably, the Bible brings out, he was put to death on the cross for all the wrong things that you and I have ever done and ever would do. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead, showing that the Father accepted what he had done on the cross for us, and all that he ever said about himself, it was all completely true. And then Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21, For our sake he made him, Jesus, to be sin." Who knew no sin? 
It's the great exchange. Our, our sins were laid upon him. He was regarded as having our sins while he was there on the cross and punished for our sins while he was there on the cross. But then it says, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, not only were our sins laid upon him while he was there on the cross and he suffered for us while he was there on the cross, but also when we truly believe in Jesus Christ, his righteousness is reckoned to us. His righteousness is regarded as ours. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 4, verse 5. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. The moment someone truly believes in Jesus Christ, at that moment you are justified. God, as the judge, declares you righteous. Not because in yourself you are righteous, you're not. Uh, it said earlier, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You're not fully righteous of your own, but God regards you as righteous. He declares you righteous because he looks upon you as if you have the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. So how can I be pleasing to God? First, and most importantly, all importantly, you need to come into a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. If you've never done so, you can do that even here this morning. And these verses bring out, it's all of grace uh, to the one who does not work. He does not try to do things. He does not do religious rituals. To the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. So if you've never done so, what, whatever your background has been up to the, even this very moment right here and right now, this morning, you can be forgiven of all your sins and you can be credited with Christ's righteousness simply by uh, believing in Jesus Christ as he is offered to you in the gospel. Have you done that? Have you done that? If you never have, by God's grace, I call out to you this morning, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and you'll be forgiven and you'll be reckoned righteous. And as one who's reckoned righteous, you'll be pleasing in God's sight. He looks at you in a sense through the lens of Jesus Christ. When he saw Jesus Christ at his baptism, said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. If you believe in Jesus Christ, it's as if God looks at you and says, this is Billy Bob with whom I'm well pleased. There's a difference, of course. But he looks upon us through the lens of his son, Jesus Christ. That's justification. Now, as those who've been justified, you're now brought into God's family. Now, we seek to live each day to be pleasing to our Heavenly Father. You're still in Ecclesiastes, I believe. Turn over to the last book of the, the last chapter of this book, in verse 13, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. It's almost like uh, Solomon saves up till about the very, very end to just make it very blunt what this is all about. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Uh, this is after you've been saved, after you've been forgiven, after you come into relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. If you ask, is there purpose in life? Yes, I live for the one who created me. I seek to please Him with my life. Well, how do I know what pleases Him? I see what He commands in the Bible. I see what He commands in the Scriptures. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, I seek to keep His commandments. Yes, we'll still stumble and fall. We'll still sin until we hit heaven someday. When we do, we seek his fatherly forgiveness, and then we seek his help to do, do right the next time and put that sin behind us. Uh, but these are the basics of a life lived pleasing to him. This is what gives meaning to life. And as we saw in chapter 2, God, as he determines, graciously grants us. Chapter 2, verse 6. For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge 
and joy. Don't fall for the lies of the world and what it tells you gives meaning. Don't think this is all just simple-minded Bible stuff. I need to get beyond that to what the commercials tell me or what the media tells me or what the world tells me. No, don't move beyond this. This is what God says. And this is from a man who had all those things. Learn from Solomon's mistakes. Live your life to be pleasing to the one who created you. Live according to his word. This gives your life meaning and purpose and, at God's discretion, joy. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Again, we thank you for uh, your servant Solomon. As we see how sin took him much far further than I believe he ever thought it would and led him down roads that I believe he, he couldn't have imagined that he would go down as, as a young man. And as he lived for a time in his life as, as if you weren't there or as if you weren't real or as if he didn't need to live for you, uh, we see all the stuff that he had, but we also see how he concluded, this is vanity. This is worthless. I hate it. Father, you know all of us who are here this morning, maybe even as your children, we, some of us have stumbled into thinking, well, really, life is about these other things. And it's not about living to please you. Through your servant Solomon, remind us, our, our life is lived for you. It's about you. And by your Holy Spirit, help us to come back to that. Just that simple-minded, uh, simple faith. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is what things are about. If there be someone here this morning <clears throat> who's never been saved, Father, we'd ask as they heard the gospel earlier that Christ died for their sins and rose again from the dead, that they can be saved and forgiven and declared righteous and be pleasing to you on account of Christ's perfect righteousness. And they can receive all this through repentance and faith in your Son, Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you convict them of where they're at and the meaninglessness and the hopelessness and the futility of life and desire a new beginning, a new start, even here today. And Father, would you draw them to yourself and grant them repentance and faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask all this in his name. Amen.